Hey everybody, welcome back to Jim's Garage. In this video, we're gonna be having a look at the Melee 4C Quieter. I'm excited because it's the first time I've got to use the N150, the successor to the ever popular N100. Now before we go, obviously this thing is gonna be low powered. It's four cores, it's passively cooled, and it has a TDP of six watts, albeit we know the TDP is just a number. It's not reflective of actual power draw. Now this thing is about the same size as the Raspberry Pi, but in my opinion, it packs a lot more. Being an Intel CPU with DDR5 RAM and also an NVMe drive, it gives us some expansion capabilities that we just can't get on the Pi. And it also runs popular x86 applications. So in this video, I'm gonna go over what this device is, sort of what it costs, what its competitors are. I'll do a teardown of the device and I'll show it running both Windows with some performance benchmarks and also running Linux where I think this thing actually does shine as a mini home lab. Now for full transparency, this device was sent to me, but no money changed hands. And I did state that I have to have full control over the narrative, which Melee were happy to abide by. Now, as you know from my previous video, I'm not gonna pull any punches where I think there are issues with the device. I'm not gonna recommend something that I don't like. Anyway, let's jump into an overview of what this device is. Now, it wouldn't be right of me to talk about this device in isolation. We need to have a look at what the competition has. And unfortunately, just like my last video, it seems like B-Link has them beaten. If we have a look here, we've got the B-Link EQ14. Now, this is rocking the same Intel N150, and it also has 500 gigabytes of storage and 16 gigabytes of RAM. The key thing really with the RAM is that it's DDR4, not DDR5, but I don't think that's gonna be a problem for performance given that we're only dealing with a low four core CPU anyway. The real kicker here is if we look on the reverse of this device. You can see here that it has dual NICs and not only does it have dual NICs, but it also has dual NVMe and you can also replace the RAM, which I couldn't find a way to do on this device. Albeit you might be able to unscrew it, I just didn't want to risk breaking the device. So you might be thinking, great, but I'm sure that comes at a price. It does come at a price, a much cheaper price. If we have a look at this thing on their website, we can see that it retails for $199. That's comparable to the official website for the Melee, which retails at $400. That's also reflected on Amazon, with it being priced at £189 for that model, and the Melee being £275. So I cannot recommend getting this over the B-Link, even if the price was the same, simply because you get a lot more value for money. I'm also really interested in how this is actually cooled, because here you can see what looks to be a much beefier heatsink on the B-Link as opposed to the Melee. Now, don't get me wrong, I like the build quality of the Melee. It is solid, it is small, it is compact. And again, similar to my previous review, if for some reason, a few extra millimeters, maybe an actual centimeter here, is the deal breaker, then maybe the Melee is the right one to go for. But from everything I can see and my experience is telling me, the B-Link is definitely the one to go for out of the two. So specifically on the Melee, it does come with various options. You can see still the older N100 model, but down here you can see different flavors of the N150, 8 gig, 16 gig, and 32, and also different iterations of storage. The main differentiator here is that you're gonna get LDDR5 RAM as opposed to LDDR4 on the B-Link, but that's pretty much the only difference. In terms of connectivity, it's basically the same, minus that RJ45 and minus the internal connectivity and changes. So the device itself is not much bigger than the Raspberry Pi, you can see here. And it's made of a mainly, I think, metal construction. Feels really solid, pretty good. The heatsink as well feels sturdy. So having a quick look, we've got the power button here on the front. On the side, we've got the USB ports, two USB 3s and a USB 2. On the reverse, we've got a USB-C and this one super speed with display port out. We've got a headphone and microphone jack and also an SD card reader. We've got two HDMI ports and a small reset hardware button here. And then we've got the 12 volt USB-C power here. Now during my testing, I was able to use this port here on the left with my Ugreen mobile phone charger. That was via power delivery, but that obviously then removes that slot. 
And from all the testing that I've done, I couldn't get any data to come out of this USB-C port here. I believe this one is specifically for power only. So you can use either, but it probably makes sense to use the bundled charger with this one so that you can use the USB-C port over here. Finally, we've got the Realtek NIC over here on the right. This is a one gigabit NIC. Lastly, on the final side, we've got the Kensington lock so you can actually secure this. Now, as well in the packaging comes a bracket for a VESA mount, so you could put this on the back of your monitor, and you could also power this thing if your monitor supports it through plugging in to this USB-C port here with power delivery. So let's have a quick look now inside this device and let's find out what is actually upgradable. So now that those are out, we can actually just lever this to the side and it should reveal the inner workings. Now in here you can see that there's a big sort of heat sink on the back here. That seems to connect to the circuit board and I suspect on the back of that circuit board if I could take this out the CPU would be on the underside of this motherboard. Under here you can see that we've got a full size NVMe slot with a heat sink that's applied to it. Doesn't look like you'd be able to fit your own in here so you'll just have to use a thermal pad but again this is gen 3 by 4 so heat really isn't an issue albeit this is a passively cooled system and you did see it getting up towards 80 degrees but pleased to say that the drive temps didn't really exceed sort of 65 that is on the warm side but again this thing is probably not going to be pegged at 100 all of the time with the lid off there's not really much to say it's an sbc so we can't change the cpu we can't change the RAM, but we can upgrade the storage. If we remove all of the screws into the motherboard, I'm hoping that we can pull this thing out. Unfortunately, after a little bit of prying, I can't actually get this out without breaking it, I think. Or if someone does know how to do it, please tell me. Um, and I really like this device, so I'm not going to want to break this. So I'm going to put the screws back in, I'm going to put the lid back on, and we can hop over now and have a look what actually is on this device. During my review, I did do some drive performance tests, and it was good to see that we did seem to be saturating the full PCIe 3x4 link for that NVMe drive. I was getting sort of 3.5 gig on the sequential reads, which is what I would expect from a top performing NVMe in PCI Gen 3. I also wanted to check the temperatures of the drive whilst I was performing this test, because given it's a small form factor PC that's passively cooled, I did think that temperature could be an issue. This was during that same read test and you can see here that the drive is hitting 72 degrees which is definitely on the toasty side and it doesn't leave much headroom especially if this is going to be in a warm environment and potentially even if you did attach this to a device say the back of a monitor a tv or maybe on top of a home entertainment system so say something like an amplifier that could really be an issue here to test the performance of this device, I did run a Cinebench R24, and here you can see that the temperatures were running about 75 to 76 degrees, and there were maximums of 82. At no point did I actually see this thermal throttle, but again, this was run in about a 19 to 20 degree ambient temperature. So again, if this is being put in a warm environment with other electronics, that is definitely something to look out for. During that same test, if we have a look, the actual drive temperatures were much better. They were down at 4. So whilst that isn't a drive intensive test, it does show that the thermals are under control in just CPU tasks. Running the Cinebench test, you can see here that we got 134 points on the multi-core, which doing some cursory research online, most of the results I could see were from about 130 to 145. So this is somewhere just below the middle point. So that doesn't surprise me. It is passively cooled, maybe if this had a better cooling solution it might be able to clock higher for longer and possibly if I could get to the device maybe just a simple repaste could do a better job, get those thermals down, get that performance up. In terms of how this sits within the stack it pretty much does what it says on the tin. This is a cheap entry level CPU that's designed to be sort of passively cooled so don't expect scorching figures here. During the testing, I was keen to see the power draw on this. And as you can see, it's reporting around 7 watts during the actual test itself, with spikes up to 11 watts. Now, bear in mind, this is the reporting from the CPU itself, which isn't necessarily indicative of the actual power draw. The best way to do this is to take a wall reading. And when I was hammering this with both Cinebench R24 and a simultaneous drive test, 
this was pulling around 15 watts. I could have possibly done a GPU test as well at the same time, and that probably would have nudged it a couple of watts higher. But all said and done, this thing is going to be sitting under 20 watts, and for most of the time, as long as you're not pegging it, it will probably be hovering around the 10 watt mark, which is pretty cool. Now, what I find quite interesting about this device is its ability to be a very small form factor, low TDP, bare bones home lab server. So in this instance, I'm going to deploy my pop-up home lab, which I covered in a previous video, and this should give me a reasonable startup to see how this thing can behave. The key thing really that I've done as well is to pass Jellyfin the iGPU in this device and I've also downloaded the Big Bug Bunny Sunflower. This is in 4K 60fps so hopefully we should get some transcoding on this device. So if I execute this script we should hopefully then go away pull all of those containers and hopefully I've got a test bed now to have a look at how this thing actually functions. It's going to take a little bit of time to pull all those containers. Again, this is that N150. It's a quad-core CPU, but it shouldn't take too long as all it's doing is setting this stuff up. I'll see you on the other side. And so now that's completed, I've just gone into the Bortana, which this stack has. You can see all of these are up and running. We've also got the Jellyfin here, and if I go to Jellyfin where I've been doing some experimentation, we should hopefully see transcoding with hardware. So taking a look in Jellyfin, if we go to the dashboard and then we check on the playback for the transcoding, you'll see here that the GPU has been added to Jellyfin within the Docker container. And with any luck, if we start to play this file, let's click play, this should render it in its native resolution, so it should be supported. If we check the playback info, I've changed it here and you can see that it's doing transcoding now so it's not playing natively and if we hop over into the command line interface we should be able to see this with intel top here you can see that we've got the video being used 99 percent and that render as well so here we've got a gpu pass through on this small device on the n150 doing the transcoding for us so the cpu isn't being hit so where does this ultimately land me in my review? Well, unfortunately, I would just say go and buy the B-Link. Don't get me wrong, I do like this device. It's well built, it's a great little small form factor package that is passively cooled and sips power. But when you consider it's more than twice as expensive as the B-Link offering, and as I've tried to position this in my review, if you're looking for an entry-level bare bones budget home lab server, just go with the B-Link. You're gonna get an extra nick. You could even make it a firewall. You're gonna get an extra NVMe slot and you can also get access to the RAM. Those things are huge and what looks like a beefier cooler as well, so maybe you'll get higher performance out of the CPU and just better temperatures across the board. Now, I hope Melly are listening to this video and I hope you can take away some of this constructive feedback. I think for you guys to become disruptive in this market, you've gotta be on par with what the others are offering. And I'll be more than willing to test that again once you have done. Anyway, let me know what you think about this product down in the comments below. As always, if you've liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.